Hi, everyone. So I'm very excited to be hosting this panel today. I have four accomplished uh, speakers who are all some of the leaders of the uh, most prominent civil rights organizations in the U.S. And I've worked with some of you all in our reporting uh, at Recode and Vox on issues about hate speech and social media. And uh, I will just briefly announce everyone I'm talking to, say hello to you all, and then we will jump into some questions. So I'll start off by introducing Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP. Derek, it is so nice to meet you and be with you here today. Good to be here. Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change. Nice to see you and talk to you today. You too, you too. Jessica Gonzalez, co-CEO of Free Press. Jessica, thanks for being here. Thank you, good morning. And last but definitely not least, Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO and National Director of the ADL. Jonathan, nice to talk to you today. Nice to talk to you, Shireen. Great. So I'll start off also by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Shireen Ghaffari. I am a reporter for Recode and Vox, and I have been covering the technology industry for uh, over four years now and specifically focusing uh, on social media companies in the past couple of years. And, uh, you know, one of the major topics on this beat is obviously hate speech and misinformation and how that contributes to real world harm sometimes. And so in June, everyone talking to me today was part of a historic campaign uh, called the Stop Hate for Profit campaign to pressure social media companies to limit hate speech on their platforms. So now that we're, you know, fast forward to a couple months later, uh, and there was this historic ad pause as part of this campaign, right, to try to get advertisers to, um, you know, really urge companies like Facebook to limit the amount of hate speech on their platforms. And now we're, we're a couple months forward and I want to take a step back and just ask you all how that campaign started. So I'm going to put my first question to Derek and just ask, you know, Derek, can you tell us a little bit of the backstory about how the Stop Hate for Profit campaign came to be? Well, I can start with how we got involved. I think there are a lot of moving parts before uh, our involvement. Uh, for the NAACP, uh, we recognize the power of social media platforms. And you had many individuals, uh, such as Color Change, such as the work Jessica was doing, such as the work that Jonathan was doing, uh, actually prior to me taking this position. And so I walked into uh, the position understanding that, that there was a problem in the 2016 election, the extent of which uh, we had not really appreciated until after there were several reports. Uh, for me, in walking to this position, I knew NAACP with our, our relationship with communities across the country, we are in 47 states, 2,200 units, uh, we needed to build out a strategic approach to deal with the civic engagement calendar over five years, not looking at the transaction of one election, but how we engage our members. And, but in doing so, I began to see the two and of social media platforms and how it was being used against us. So our first foray in, in, into bringing issues uh, concerning Facebook is after seeing several media accounts and their inability to, or no, their ability, but their refusal to address how that platform was one, allowing white supremacist groups to convene on the platform recruit on the platform, uh, plot out uh, uh, issues that could cause harm and then executing on those harms. And so that's how we first got involved with this advocacy program. But I think others here can really talk about how Stop Pay for Profit started because there was so much work before I even got involved. Great, well, I will point it to whoever else on the panel wants to add to how the Stop Hate for Profit campaign came to be and what was motivating it at that time back in June. 
Perhaps I can try well, I to can... take this one. Oh, sorry. Go, Jeff. Go ahead, Jonathan. I'll go after you. Uh, we'll start with Jessica say... and then go to Jonathan. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So I can say a bit about how Free Press got involved. Um, I'd been working um, for many years uh, tracking how the white supremacist movement was utilizing media generally to organize and normalize uh, violence. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and of course, the proliferation of social media meant that while organizing wasn't new for white supremacists, that they had uh, a really uh, powerful set of tools to spread their message, to recruit, to raise funds, and to normalize and invite more people into their cause. Um, this was, of course, uh, very dangerous before we were even talking about the 2020 election. So I'd been working with a group called Change the Terms, led by women and people of color um, that is was w working to stop hate online. And so when we were getting very frustrated with Facebook in particular, social comp media companies generally, because of their refusal to stop the flow of hate, to stop amplifying hate. So it wasn't just that hate was happening by third parties, their algorithms were actually driving people to hate groups, driving people um, to disinformation, and they absolutely refused to stop it. So we spent several years engaging with them. We would get, they would give us crumbs and pretend like it was cake. And we finally decided that we had to take it up a notch. We had started talking internally about, um, potentially boycotting Facebook. And then we heard from our friends at ADL that they had something similar planned. And so um, we thought it was the right moment to join forces ahead of the election, not just because of the pro proliferation of disinformation, but because of how communities of color often get scapegoated in political conversations. Great, and Jonathan. Can you sure. tell us a little bit about how you convened, uh, you know, other partners to come together in this group and, and how the ADL was thinking about this when it started? So ADL has been thinking about these issues for many years, like all of the organizations on this panel. And in 2017, we opened a center in Silicon Valley in order to facilitate our engagement with the companies and focus fully on the role that social media was playing in spreading stereotypes and hate. And we've done a lot of engagement with the businesses, but increasingly we came to discover that, you know, to be frank, self-regulation wasn't a sufficient strategy and that we needed to be able not just to work with the companies constructively, but to call them out critically when they refused to take action. And this past summer, after the murder of George Floyd, our analysts were tracking white supremacists who were openly organizing through Facebook groups about how to undermine and subvert the Black Lives Matter protests how to dress up as if they were, I don't know, Antifa activists or something and literally discredit the peaceful protests. So I was having a dialogue with Jim Steyer from Common Sense Media, who's also you know, a very large child advocacy group, a partner of ADL. And when we went to Facebook and said, you need to do something and they were unwilling to act with the swiftness that we thought was you know, so critical and so obvious, we felt it was time to act. And so I picked up the phone called my friend Derek Johnson at NAACP, reached out to Jessica Gonzalez, and in particular also reached out to Rashad Robinson, because Color of Change has done so much groundbreaking work uh, about the role of the social media companies and Facebook specifically, and said, guys, I think it's time for us to actually do something at scale. And we felt that it made sense to focus initially on corporate advertisers because set the $70 billion you know, revenue machine that drives Facebook and has made it one of the most successful companies in the history of business. We felt that going to the corporate advertisers and showing them how their dollars were subsidizing white nationalism, grotesque racism, you know, abhorrent anti-Semitism. If we could show them examples, that might move them to change. And that's ultimately what kicked off the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. Thank you. And 
you know, you're, the, the ad pause that was kind of the centerpiece of this campaign in, uh, in the summer, it was a one month pause, right? And can you tell us, you know, gained, I think, over a thousand advertisers support and we're talking some major corporations. Can you just walk us through uh, some of the, the top advertisers who joined in on this? And then, you know, what you think the impact was of all of this looking back now? And so I, I'll pose that to whoever wants to take it, uh, whether that's Jonathan or Rashad, I know you haven't talked yet. Jonathan, why don't you go and then I'll jump in after. Okay. I talk about that. So when we launched this, we thought let's engage advertisers and let's again post to them, take a month off from Facebook in July. We started this in mid-June. I will tell you, we didn't have a single company lined up when we started this, but Rashad, Derek, Jessica and I, Jim and the others all said, let's give this a shot. Within just a few weeks, we had over a thousand of the biggest brands on the planet. Companies like Disney, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Microsoft, Levi's, Hershey's, some of the most iconic American brands, big global brands like VW, Honda, Heineken, SAP, so many others. Um, also lots of small businesses, a number of nonprofits. And we were also supported by, you know, a number of interesting celebrities who spoke up and spoke out, people like Sasha Baron Cohen, whose speech to ADL uh, last November in some ways really catalyzed this. Uh, and then some other people, and maybe Rashad can talk about some of the other figures who helped to give this lift. Yeah. So, you know, when I when I think about sort of some of the ways in which it was impactful, right, the campaign was impactful, you know, Color of Change has been at the table trying to engage, push, and challenge Facebook for almost six years now. Um, you know, starting with the, all the ways in which Black Lives Matter activists were being doxxed on the platform, meaning that um, uh, sensitive and private information was being put out um, for those that sort of wanted to do folks harm. Uh, there was illegal surveillance um, and turning over um, information to law enforcement without the sort of proper course. And then there was a woman in Baltimore by the name of Corrine Gaines who was in the middle of a police interaction. She had her Facebook Live on. Facebook reached out to law enforcement, had law enforcement, law enforcement reached out to Facebook and had Facebook turn off the Facebook Live and Corrine ended up um, dead. And without the sort of information and visibility, um, the city of Baltimore has now had to pay out uh, Corrine's family, um, you know, money, but that never brought Kareem back, nor does it give us the sort of images that would have, that Kareem wanted us to see. And, you know, we ended up in back and forth with Facebook for years. We demanded a Facebook audit and worked with members of Congress, um, particularly Cory Booker's office, Senator Booker's office, to actually get the um, Facebook civil rights audit in place. And then Facebook started to do, committed to the civil rights audit. And then they um, say that they're, um, then we find out in the New York Times that they had hired a PR firm to attack us and to um, uh, basically spy on us and um, and pitch negative stories behind the scenes about us. And we found out from the New York Times. So we've been in this place where we have like been working at the table, found out they attacked us. Then we come back to the table more. Then we work and we bring them to Atlanta, Sheryl Sandberg, to meet with activists on the ground, to hear from frontline activists and to hopefully engage and think about a different Court path forward. Um, and we get commitments around policies only to have them not enforce it. And so part of the reason why we got involved in this campaign was very much with this idea that we couldn't keep going back to the table, much like my colleagues here, um, making demands, even when they say they're going to do something, then they don't actually do it. And so what we got to sort of um, was actually a very sort of um, interesting moment where the the final version of the civil rights audit was coming out as we were sort of in the midst of this boycott. And what we saw was a company that previously told us that they couldn't do certain things, scrambling to figure it out. Um, we watched as the publicity of the campaign really spurred Facebook to action. We ended up in more conversations um, with Facebook about particular things. They started to announce some changes connected to the demands. The challenge with Facebook continues to be the incentive structures there and the fact that even when they say they're going to do something, they don't actually do it because growth and profit will always supersede safety, integrity and security. 
But I do think what's really important here is bringing together social justice activists with big corporations. None of us, nobody would think that we're sort of always on the same page, right? But these folks came yeah. together to send a very powerful message. And the thing that about that was, is that we raised attention and the specter of the problem to a point where now the, both the government and all other forces have to pay attention. No longer can Facebook sort of do this work undercover and think that they're just hosting sort of a, a, a picture book for our grandparents, um, um, that they are actually hosting one of the most um, harmful forces to our democracy and our economy. And that, I think, is also one of the powerful features of this campaign. It is hard to do economic damage to a monopoly through boycotts. What we have done, though, I think, is build the sort of public attention and hopefully the public will to put in the type of changes and oversight and regulations that are going to be necessary to rein in this force that has um, created so much damage and has the potential to create so much more. You know, and I, was, I want to add that what I also see is impactful that what started off as a a national campaign is now a global reality. We are we are in ongoing conversation with individuals who have been impacted by Facebook, concerned about their activities around the globe. Uh, that's positive. Secondly, uh, I truly believe many of the things that would have happened this election cycle uh, was somewhat quashed because the eyes of of the of the public was on Facebook, knowing that they have allowed their platform to be used in the past to actually persuade elect electoral outcomes. Uh, but I'm also concerned, just recently, uh, uh, we had someone, uh, Bannon, go on and, and call for the beheading of, of, of Fauci. And, and Facebook basically said, Zuckerberg basically said, it didn't violate their community standards. Well, what kind of community standards do you have where calling for the beheading of a public official is okay? That tells us that still there's so much more work to be done and they're playing more to the political conversation than they are to the health and safety of our nation and, and our democracy. Yeah, <clears throat> agree with everything that's been said here. And I would just add some of the things that we saw Facebook do during the election cycle, I'm not sure we would have seen without the tremendous attention and public pressure um, that this campaign was part of. So for instance, we had never seen Facebook fact check the president's posts in any sense. And while I believe the labels that they put on his um, post claiming fraud or all the other you know, false things that he's been claiming during the election period, there was actually a flag. There was at a certain point, um, Facebook said that they would slow the spread of those posts. Do I think it was enough? No, I think it was far too little, far too late. But I have to say, I do not believe there would have been any significant flagging of content if not for the public pressure and attention placed on Facebook. And the other thing I think that was really interesting to watch as this all played out was not just how Facebook reacted, but also how other big tech companies reacted. They were carefully watching. They did not want to be the next uh, you know, target of a boycott. And we actually saw a lot of changes from Reddit and Twitter uh, in this period as well. Right. So it sounds like, of course, you know, the the one month ad boycott did not break Facebook's business. But uh, what you all are saying is that you, you did see uh, some changes from them, particularly around this election and uh, and just an increased sense of pressure, I think, from the public and on the other tech companies as well, that, that, that civil rights organizations are watching them, advertisers are watching them and, and uh, aware of the kind of vitriol that we can see on these platforms. Now, I want to play devil's advocate for a second. You know, it's my job as a reporter. But you know, Facebook is a platform for, where anyone can really say almost whatever they want with very little restrictions. And you know, for a long time, not just Facebook, but YouTube, Twitter, all these companies have long said, we want to be as open as possible. We want to let people, uh, we know that, that we don't have a legal obligation to let them say whatever they want, but we, in the spirit of free speech, um, think that you know, whether it's good or bad, controversial or not, people should be able to share, and that there's also a lot of good on these platforms. There's 
There's a lot of people who use it to connect with their family and friends and, and not do the kinds of hateful things that we're talking about. But I want to I want to get into why you all think that that logic doesn't hold and that the kind of stuff that you're seeing when you talk about hate speech, why it crosses a line where you don't think that people should have the right to spread it on Facebook or Twitter. So let me, let me well, jump well, in I, here. The, sorry, con the concept of free speech is based on a First Amendment right. And I fully support that concept. But even with that concept, there are guardrails. You cannot scream fire in a crowded theater because you can cause harm to individuals as a result. And what we're saying is we support the right of free speech, but you should not be as a platform scream fire in that audience when it has been shown when you do so, people are, are harmed. Whether it's the synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, the church in Louisville, Kentucky, that fortunately was locked and they went to the Kroger's and killed someone, whether it was uh, the incident that took place in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, there, are, there are countless examples of screaming fire on the platform has resulted in people being harmed and murdered. So there are guardrails to free speech. Free isn't free when it's going to cause harm to your neighbor and when it's going to cause harm to other people. And to be, and to be clear, this is also not free speech. There's a lot of money being exchanged hands. A $70 billion company, like, is the, the speech is not free. People are paying for it and people are profiting off of it. And that is also incredibly important. And so, yes, people have a right to say some things that are really horrible. They don't necessarily have a right to make money off of it. And there isn't, and freedom of speech is not freedom from the consequences of speech. And so, part of the sort of thing that I think is really important. Um, about sort of even how Facebook talks about it is that they, when you listen to Mark Zuckerberg, he's not actually saying free speech, he's saying free expression because he recognizes right. that there's some sort of, there's, there's, there's differences between both the consequences that um, 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 an institution like a newspaper has, um, an institution like a, a, t a television news outlet has in terms of the content that they put out in the world and the consequences for truth and fact. Um, Facebook wants to have it multiple ways. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think one of the one of the things that we have to remember is that that just like TV, just like um, the radio, where these have been platforms where you're absolutely right. Information can sometimes be shared that is very helpful. These platforms can be um, vehicles for um, telling stories. There are so many examples of this in our society of mediums that have allowed people to communicate the telephone. It doesn't mean that we don't have rules. It doesn't mean that there are not regulations. It doesn't mean that there's not oversight and consequence for how these tools are actually used. And so I think it's important that even as we think about sort of the sort of role of these of these platforms in, in what they like to think about as free speech, um, uh, that um, just because we are not paying for um, the use of a Twitter or a Facebook doesn't mean it's free. When you are not paying for something, then most likely you are the product. And our data in and us as individuals using those platforms, we are the product. And so it's just important to, for folks to sort of remember that as we think about what are the rules of the road that are going to be necessary. You know, we all have a right to free speech, but we don't have a right to be amplified by these social media platforms. Um, as a woman of color, I can tell you free speech has never been free for many of us. And so we have to, when we're talking about free speech, Congress shall make no law. Yes, I agree with that. But, but this is not Congress. This is not a government actor. This is a place where people come together to connect and to be in community with each other. And Facebook has a responsibility to those communities to keep them safe. Um, and when people are the subjects of hate and harassment, we are not safe. And we need look no further than what happened in El Paso last year, where um, a shooter went to a Walmart with a specific purpose to kill Mexican, Latino, and immigrant people. And he, he referred to them as um, 
a species, an invasive species. Where did we see that language before? 2,200 ads running at the same time from the Trump campaign calling uh, immigrants an invasion. These words have consequences. And so as a private company, Facebook has a responsibility to consider those consequences and to protect its users. Thank you all. And, and for our last question, I want to sort of look forward and ask, you know, when Stop 8 for Profit launched, it received national attention, press. It was a force. Uh, now, you know, what do you think the future is? These problems still exist. Hate speech has not disappeared on social media, right? Uh, it's going to be a problem for decades to come. What do you think is next in terms of the work that you all are doing? Will there be a continuation of this campaign uh, or any related efforts? Maybe I can try to take a first crack at that, Shireen. Sure. So I think number one, we can look at what we accomplished in July. We never thought we would bankrupt Facebook, but we did think we would put a dent in their public reputation. And I think we achieved that. Again, because of the ownership structure and Mark's control of the board, and he owns 64% of the shares, they're not vulnerable to the typical fiduciary pressure of most public companies, but they are very vulnerable to reputational pressure. And as my colleagues have said, I think the attention we put on Facebook, the spotlight we cast on the company led to a series of concessions, the civil rights audit that Rashad mentioned, um, submitting to do, take more action, get armed militias off the platform, Holocaust denialism off the platform, and many other things. We then were able to organize celebrities in September to get off Instagram during that week. That also brought a lot of attention as some of the most prominent public personalities on the platform stepped back. Now, as we look at a new congressional session that starts in January and a new uh, administration in the executive branch, I think there's real opportunity to look at a, a, a policy agenda. And I think you can imagine the ways different parts of the executive and legislative branches might be involved in finally taking action on things like Section 230 and what are, as, as Derek described, the effective guardrails so that Facebook applies by the same laws of gravity, lives by the same laws of gravity that Vox Media, right, and traditional broadcast and print companies do. I think secondly, privacy is an issue. And thirdly, competition is an issue. As Rashad said, you know, they are a monopoly. And I think we need to think about what are ways that our, uh, you know, government elected officials and policymakers could take action to ensure that the monopolistic indifference that we saw this summer doesn't prevail in the future. So I think the best is yet to come in terms of what Stop Eight for Profit will do. I, I certainly think the pu public pressure can and should continue. We will not stop tracking, analyzing, and making noise about unethical business practices at Facebook and elsewhere. However, uh, I do agree that we need to re-examine this country's relationship with truth and I actually think there's some robust examination of, of where are we in this country with our relationship with truth? And wh what are the corrupt and unethical business incentives that have made truth harder to come by in this country? Because we all know that conspiracy theories and disinformation, those are tactics of white supremacy. And so we have to examine what are the conditions that are pre um, present in these businesses that make it harder for us to have a, a common set of facts that we're working from? We need to invest in robust local independent journalism. We do need regulation and legislation to get at the business incentives of these companies that extract our personal data and use them to manipulate and target us. And so there, there is legislation we need to be thinking about. There's organizing we still need to be doing, but we also actually need to step back and look at the state of journalism, look at the state, who are our truth tellers? How do we build them up? How do we support them? And how do we make the structural changes that we need so that we're not in this situation playing whack-a-mole again in four years, eight years, 12 years? Great, well, um, if anyone has anything else to add, I will give a chance now, otherwise we can wrap up the session. Thank you so much everyone for talking to me today. This was a, uh, as expected, uh, very 
interesting and thoughtful discussion. And I hope to be in touch with all of you in the future about your ongoing work on these issues. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you. Thank you.